the science that stopped a $6 billion offshore gas project because the crocodile man, Jirakupai, and the mother certain, Ampiji, would have to swim over a pipeline. Why were scientists involved in trying to validate these legends? And why did they effectively make stuff up like submerged burial grounds and found an Aboriginal song line, a mythical direction story that was supposedly 9,000 years old to a lake way out to sea from when the sea level was 100 metres lower, a song line to a waterhole, and the scientists found it. What got Timmy so excited was that he recognised these waterholes as being a point along the kangaroo song line, a song line that he'd sung for most of his life but had never seen before. And here he is observing them for the first time in a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> These... But wait till you hear what the judge said when he ended up in court. My conclusions about Dr. O'Leary's lack of regard for the truth, lack of independence and lack of scientific rigour are sufficient to discount or dismiss all of his reports for all purpose. Which is actually just the start. But after telling this sad story, I will ultimately defend Dr. O'Leary a little bit at least. Let's start at the beginning. In the Northern Territory, there's a series of ocean gas fields and there's a new one called Barossa. And the gas company Santos wanted to build a pipeline from the gas field back to shore at Darwin. The gas pipeline would pass the Tiwi Islands about 10 kilometres from the shore of the, the, the islands at a water depth of about 50 metres. And just think how ridiculous this is. The pipeline passed over a song line and Ampiji and Jirakupai were somehow affected. And what's more, the scientists found where Ampiji and Jirakupai lived 9,000 years ago when the sea level was 100 metres lower than now. It confirmed the song line. You see, they reckon that this song line, which is essentially a memory song, which was sometimes used by Aboriginal people to help document directions, this one passed down 600 generations by the elders, orally remembered. None of this was written. The song line supposedly went from the southwest corner of the islands to an ancient lake that was 20 kilometres offshore, straight over the pipeline. I mean, talk about convenient, but what is the chance that this sort of detailed story, like a direction to a lake, could survive after 9,000 years? A direction to an old lake which hasn't existed for a long time, where the crocodile and the serpent lived. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about the science here, but it's crazy that this even went to court. Remember as a child playing the game, the telephone game, we used to call it Chinese whispers. When you pass a message from one person to another and that do it for many times. Wikipedia gives a good example of how the initial message becomes completely garbled. Their example is a message that started out with only the good die young and it ended up being the three Vikings visit Christ. Why was this in court when there are rules of evidence that often take a very dim view of hearsay, that is evidence where somebody says they heard somebody else say or do something. But in this case, it was hearsay 600 times and 9,000 years ago. You know, there is just a small chance the whole story of the serpent and the crocodile it might not be true. But the court had to take this seriously because that's the law apparently. And there are literally hundreds of pages in the court judgment where they're debating about this mythological story, such as this evidence. And PG is the mother of all waters on the Tiwi Islands. She is the key to the system which lets us carry on our lives, our culture and our happiness. If it goes ahead, Mother MPG will stop listening to us. The system will turn off. Everything will stop spiritually. The stars and the sky will change. Jirakupai will be affected and all of our food resources and sea life will disappear. Well, I'm not going to comment on that, but I am going to comment on the scientific issues. And in my opinion, where some scientists and the Environmental Defenders Office manipulated the mythological story to stop the pipeline. But not only did the scientists find the lake, they also identified using acoustic images, supposedly, basic echo sounders, 
these echo sounders of the seabed, huge burial grounds in roughly 50 meters of water depth, three of them, two or three kilometers long each, and maybe half a kilometer wide. I mean, these are huge. Can you imagine the number of dead people in them, the amount of digging that must have gone on? Where else in Australia on the land do you find such huge burial grounds? Well, you don't. Not even in the European cemeteries from huge cities. And did these scientists actually dive down to look more closely at these ancient 9,000 year old burial grounds? Apparently not. They were just probably natural ridges on the seabed. But that wouldn't stop the pipeline, would it? So the pipeline was disturbing the burial grounds and MPG and Jirakupai. Anyway, this all went to court, um, which found that scientist Mick O'Leary, with the Environmental Defenders Office and others, effectively made up this so-called cultural evidence. They'd coached the indigenous witnesses, basically told the Tiwi Islanders in some of the meetings that if they could identify a song line, etc., they'd likely stop the pipe. They showed the Tiwi Islanders this map, and in my opinion, and that of the judge, it seems, they told the Tiwi Islanders that any stories that the romantic mythology calls them song lines, any stories that could put the song line out into the deep water area, which might have been the lake, then maybe this would be able to stop the pipe. And lo and behold, a song line was forthcoming. The court went into detail of how scientists and the EDO work, saying this. My second broad concern is that the words of Mr. Lewis, he's another scientist, and the EDO lawyer considered together constituted a form of subtle coaching. There was nothing at all wrong with encouraging those in attendance to tell their stories, but the cumulative effect was to urge those present to tell their stories in a way that propelled their traditions into the sea and into the vicinity of the pipeline. And then there was this one about Mick O'Leary. My concerns about Dr. O'Leary's independence and credibility are such that I would not accept his evidence as sufficient to establish any scientific proposition at all. Even if his evidence had gone unchallenged, and even if he possessed the appropriate skills, qualifications, and experience to express them, my conclusion about Dr. O'Leary's lack of regard for the truth, lack of independence, and lack of scientific rigor are sufficient to discount or dismiss all of his reports for all purposes. Now, one of the worst things that happened is that in these meetings with the Tiwi Islanders, O'Leary claimed that he'd stopped a pipeline before in Western Australia by matching a song line with an offshore lake. But this was a lie, and the judge said this. Dr. O'Leary's admission was freely volunteered, such that he did not lie to court. But he did lie to the Tiwi Islanders, and I find that he did so because he wanted his cultural mapping exercise to be used in a way that would stop the pipeline. It is conduct far flung from proper scientific method and falls short of an expert's obligation to this court. Now, I want to be fair to O'Leary here. He did admit this in court and he needs to be given credit for that but before we go on if you want to see more videos which will depress you about the sad state of some areas of science may maybe subscribe and maybe even make a comment but take care if you comment not to use the f word that's fraud don't accuse anybody of that because it has legal implications Now, scientifically, this stuff was always ridiculous. There's no way that burial mounds are going to remain underwater when the sea level rises. Those burial mounds would have been smashed as the beach moved over them, as the shoreline retreated, eroding them, mixing them. Think of, you know, basically a thousand years worth of surf waves, dozens of cyclones, tides, massive waves, nothing but rock would have survived. And it was obvious that this story was not possible, let alone whether the oral history could have survived with that much information after 9,000 years. Now, this story is actually personal for me because I knew Mick quite well, although I haven't seen him for probably 15 years since he headed to Western Australia. 
He worked as a PhD student at James Cook University in our marine geophysics laboratory under the supervision of one of the geologists. I employed him for casual work and had quite a bit to do with him socially. He's a nice guy and highly enthusiastic scientist. But in my opinion, and it seems also in the judge, Mick has been a naughty boy. But I'm going to go into back for him, not to defend what he did, but to show how he was working in a system that allowed his weaknesses to get the better of him. It is a similar problem to a definitive fraud case that I was vaguely uh, involved with, that of Una Lonstedt. I did two videos on this lady. She fabricated data about fish and was eventually caught out. Now in both these cases, they were working in a system where extravagant, frankly ridiculous claims were never checked and that encouraged them to make other more extravagant claims. Now some of you know that one of my favourite quotes about science is by C.P. Snow who said, the only ethical principle which has made science possible is that the truth shall be told all the time. If we do not penalise false statements made in error, we open the way to false statements by intention. And this is what happened to Mick, because he actually did the same thing uh, a few years earlier in a different site where he claimed to have found lakes and Aboriginal artefacts in a kangaroo song line in a site in Western Australia. This, that's where the video is from that we showed previously. It was also 10,000 years old, relates to the Dampier archipelago, and to be fair, Mick and his group that he worked with, they made some pretty stunning uh, finds there, genuine finds, the first archaeological evidence underwater in Australia. I found an artifact! I'm like, what? what? Um, they've been underwater for less than five minutes, and they'd already found a stone tool. But there's no way that as the sea level rises that those artefacts that were found by the divers were in the same place that some unfortunate Aboriginal dropped them 10,000 or how many thousand years ago. The tides and the cyclones would have totally moved everything. And even more important, there's no way that this songline story, which is now underwater, could be accurate in any detail after 10,000 years. Now, somebody should have taken him and the group aside and said, this is all going a bit crazy. You're going to end up looking like a goose. But instead, they were celebrated and humoured for their brilliance. Mick became the blue-eyed boy of the sea country stuff. He was encouraged to do more. This is Mick giving a special TED talk about his work in Western Australia. And with some of the artefacts that we'd recovered during our, our dive surveys, and I can say it was a really special moment for everybody in the room. I was presenting some of the, the locations which we had been diving, and I'd actually showing this exact image of these two waterholes when all of a sudden, Timmy Douglas, who's a Nalama man in his 90s, quiet through the entire presentation, all of a sudden pipes up and starts becoming quite animated. Timmy recognised those water holes from a song line that he'd known since long ago. What got Timmy so excited was that he recognised these water holes as being a point along the kangaroo song line, a song line that he'd sung for most of his life but had never seen before. And here he is observing them for the first time in a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and it's a lovely story and you can see Mick's enthusiasm and everybody wants it to be true because it's such a wonderful story. The crowd lapped it up, but this is no longer science and people should have put their hands up and said that. And this is where the story gets much worse. You see, Mick was told that there were huge problems and the couple who did it, Piers Larkham and Ingrid Ward, well, they ended up, did up being crucified by the University of Western Australia. Now, maybe this isn't a, another coincidence, but it turns out that Piers Larkham and I have been close collaborators for decades. We started out together as young postdocs at James Cook University, and I think we made a pretty good team actually working mostly on matters related to sediment transport. Larkham and Ward 
had been in University of Western Australia, Western Australia for a couple of decades, and they told me there was problems. And among other things, they said the stone tools and even the scene bed features that O'Leary had found would have been massively moved by the tides and cyclones. But University of Western Australia pushed Larkham and Ward out. Ward is now at the Curtin University. And they even told the science journal that published uh, Larkham and Ward's work to have that work retracted and disgracefully the journal agreed. But the reason they gave was utterly scandalous. Now, obviously, in my opinion, it looks like they just didn't want any criticism of their blue-eyed boy. But the reason was this. They said that Larkham and Ward did not have permission to use the data from the area without the permission of the local Aboriginal group where O'Leary and his group had done their original work. So Larkham and Ward effectively had to ask permission of the group they were actually criticizing to make the criticism. To me, this is worse than what O'Leary did. What do you reckon? The sad situation of Barossa could have been stopped if only O'Leary and this whole songline stuff had been brought to earth a few years ago. And there were a lot of people who were in that position that did not do that. And this is why, in my opinion, that Santos should sue the University of Western Australia. They especially failed in their duty. So what you're seeing here is a colossal failure of science that was partly resolved by a judge who did the forensic analysis the scientists failed to do. It was a colossal failure that encapsulates so much that is wrong with our society today. We have an utterly untrustworthy science system, a mixture of romantic mythology about Aboriginal people, which does not help them one little bit. A legal system that gives special rights to one group of Australians that are not granted to the others, that is seabed rights. This case should never have been in court. A pipeline 10 kilometres offshore. If those special rights had never been given in the first place, O'Leary would not have been trying to prove a mythological story and he would never have been tempted to do what he did. What do you think? And the final failure is this group called the Environmental Defenders Office, a government funded group that was funded to stop these projects, irrespective of truth, in my opinion. It almost stopped a $6 billion project. And we should look at what the judge had said. Some very special words, in fact, about the Environmental Defenders Office, such as distorting, misrepresenting, confected, and then they had to pay $9 million in court costs. But you know, with words like that, distorting, misrepresenting, confecting, in any other industry, somebody would be going to jail, I would have thought. But they have been referred to the corruption watchdog, I believe, by Senator MacDonald. And if you think this is the only case where this sort of thing is happening, then dream on like the dream time. This is just the big one that got to court. Similar sorts of what, in my opinion, are extortion, misuse of science, a crazy legal system stopping all sorts of activity from widening roads to mines. It's happening all the time. But I have a feeling, and I've said this in previous videos, that I reckon that we've reached peak insanity on this stuff. People are not tolerating it anymore. What do you reckon?